Thanks everyone for joining us for this fourth talk in the tree, Tea Time with Trees webinar series. Uh, that is a mission to bring you all closer to trees during this lockdown period, brought to you by Season Watch. We are a, a citizen science project uh, looking at how trees change with the seasons. And anyone who is interested in, in reporting scientific observations on how trees change with seasons can join in and contribute observations. Our speaker for today is Dr. Navendu Page. He's a scientist at uh, the Wildlife Institute of India, and uh, he is a, a fan of everything that is plants. His quest for research on plants has taken him to the deepest forests of the Western Ghats and to the deepest forests of the Northeast. And very re recently, he's been to Narkundam um, Island. And uh, when he's not looking at plants and when he's not teaching, uh, he's uh, busy playing ultimate frisbee and making pav bhaji for his friends. So welcome, Dr. Navendu Page, and we are really excited to have you here. Thank you so much, Geeta. And thanks, uh, Geeta and Swati and Season Watch for uh, hosting this webinar. And thanks to all of you for uh, joining this webinar today. So I'm going to quickly start by giving you a background to this webinar. And I feel that the identifying plants is actually a challenging one say that is because compared to our bird watching counterparts or people who watch butterflies or frogs or snakes or other groups, I think we plant watchers are slightly more constrained by the lack of uh, user friendly options for identifying plants. And again, one of the reasons for that is this, just the sheer diversity of plants that we see around us, right? Which makes it extremely difficult and impractical to design a single resource which sort of features all the plants that you see in a particular area or particular region, right? And on top of that, plants also exhibit so many different moods and colors and forms and phases that uh, featuring all of this variation in the form of a single book is almost uh, next to impossible. They say that flowers are like signatures of plants, right? And that is absolutely true. But again, the problem is that most of the plants that we see around us uh, show flowers for a very, very short period of time, right? Most of the trees that we see around us flower only for 15, 20 days, a month or two at the max, except of course, Lantana, which seems to be flowering uh, throughout the year. So it's not that the plants that we see around us are not very well documented. In fact, they are quite well documented in the form of local and regional floras. But again, the problem is that these floras are such technical documents that uh, navigating your way through these uh, documents is an extremely challenging task. And that's because they use extremely complex botanical terminology and without a proper background to the field of botany, I think uh, it's difficult to sort of use these floras as, uh, as field guides. And also these floras sort of organize all the plants uh, from the level of family. So unless you have an idea of what the family of particular plants belong to, it's almost impossible to use these floras. So what are the options that we have then? Well, one of the options that we have is to then photograph the plants or make an illustration like uh, what Abhishek taught us to do in the last webinar, and then approach an expert with all this information and get the plant identified. Or you could sort of rise up to the challenge of identifying the plant yourself. Now, the first approach, of course, gives you sort of very quick results, right? And it's also a very easy approach, but I don't necessarily think that it's one of the most useful approaches because at the end of this process, you yourself don't end up learning a lot. The other option, on the other hand, is a lot more time consuming. It's also often extremely frustrating, but I feel that in the long run, it's an extremely rewarding process because the joy of identifying the plant yourself cannot really match with the joy when somebody else tells you the name of a plant. And also when you identified something yourself, you're more likely to remember that particular plant or those characters for a much longer period of time, right? So the process, so webinar is uh, designed for those of you who want to independently sort of uh, the science of uh, identifying the plants. Now this uh, art and science of identifying plants, I feel is very similar to the process of solving a mystery. 
And because of the many parallels that I see between these two processes, I've taken the liberty of drawing various references from the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Now, one of the most common complaints that I hear from uh, people who are new to plants is that all plants look green and they basically all look the same. Now, that is absolutely normal to feel that way. But for those of you who experience uh, similar things, I would say that one of the reasons why we feel that all plants look the same is we more often than not tend to focus on the very general appearances of the plants or, or the overall general impressions of the plants, right? And these general appearances and general impressions, the problem, I mean, they can, of course, be useful in identifying plants and I'm not saying that you should not use them. The problem is that these general characteristics or appearances are very much subject to change, which means they are very likely to vary. A widely distributed species might look completely different in a different geographic area. A jamun tree might look totally different uh, in South India as compared to North India. So basically a species that uh, you are used to seeing in a certain way may not always appear like that if you see it in some other place, right? Which means that these general appearances that we rely on for identifying plants can often be extremely deceptive. So therefore the challenge is to then look for those clues and those characters that sort of lead you precisely to the identity of the species. Clues and characters that don't generally cheat you or don't generally mislead you and clues and characters that sort of remain consistent to a particular species. So just to illustrate this, if I ask you what this tree is that you see here in the picture, I think all of you would be able to guess that it is a mango tree. And that's exactly what a mango tree looks like uh, that is growing in an open countryside. But if you look at a mango tree growing in its natural habitat, which is say evergreen forest in the Western Ghats, let me tell you that it looks nothing like the tree that you see in the picture. Uh, and that's mostly because a mango tree growing in its natural habitat is sort of growing in the vicinity of hundreds of other individuals, right? And because of that, it attains completely different form, completely different uh, uh, sort of canopy and as a result of that even some of the most experienced botanists often often get confused uh, while identifying a mango tree in an evergreen forest. So the trick therefore is to not by general appearances and on those details on those and those characteristics which uh, sort of lead you to the precise identity of of the species. Okay so again just to draw a parallel, so what does, I don't know how many of you are Sherlock fans uh, over here, but what does Sherlock Holmes do when he arrives at a, at a crime scene, say, for example? Uh, the first thing that he does, he does a, sort of a spectacular job of observing all the clues uh, and all the details uh, that he sees at a crime scene, right? He doesn't miss even the slightest of the details that most other people seem to miss. And then what he does is that he does an excellent job of putting all these clues together. He does an excellent job of connecting these dots in a way that then helps him sort of uh, narrow down on the set of hypotheses uh, or sort of eliminate the competing hypothesis and narrow down onto a very small set of or a single hypothesis, which is then the most likely explanation for what could have happened at a crime scene, right? So the process of identifying plants is actually very similar. What you need to do is to simply train yourself to look for those clues and characters that uh, generally do not cheat you and those sort of guide you to the identity of a plant. And if, even if it doesn't guide you directly to the identity of the plant, at least it will guide you to the broad affinities of the plant. And it will help you in sort of eliminating most of the other options so that you are eventually left with only a few, right? And the final, goal of this process is to then develop a mental roadmap by associating certain characters with certain families so that when you sort of observe these characters in the field you automatically sort of go on eliminating the unlikeliest of the options and that's exactly what Sherlock does right he sort of he's sort of know it all he has knowledge of all the subjects uh, in this world and therefore he's able to make these uh, these deductions uh, you know within just a minute and effortlessly
So just to sort of illustrate that with another quote, Sherlock says that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth, right? And that's exactly what uh, we can also do when we're talking about identifying plants. So let me just give an example of what, how this process to elimination works. And uh, so to give you an example, I studied plants which is one of the most species rich areas for plants in the world. There are almost close to 700, 800 odd species of uh, woody plants in the Western Ghats. Now identifying these plants can be quite a daunting task, but just with the help of a couple of characters, just with the help of a couple of clues, what you can essentially do is you can eliminate most of your options. And that's exactly what I've done here. What I've done is I've classified those seven, 800 species of woody plants for Western Ghats and I've simply grouped them into four different categories that result from a unique combination of just two simple characters. The first character being whether a leaf is a simple leaf or a compound leaf and then followed by whether that leaf is arranged alternately or oppositely on a branch, right? And this results in four different kind of groups. And if you look at the distribution of these seven, 800 species into these four groups, you would find that they are distributed in this particular fashion. So the percentage that you see below each category is the percentage of species falling into each of these groups. Now, say for example, you have a specimen in your hand uh, of a plant from Western Ghats, and it turns out to be uh, a species which has simple leaves and the leaves are alternately arranged, right? So what this figure, uh, what this flowchart is telling you that basically, you have 50% of the species that satisfy this criteria, which means that just with the help of these two characters, what you essentially done is you eliminated 50% of your options, right? So that was just an example of how the process of deduction through elimination works. And I just uh, gave you an example of trees from the Western Ghats and just how with a couple of characters, you are able to sort of eliminate most of your options. Okay. So, uh, let's actually get down to the sort of the core of this webinar where we now are going to learn a series of clues or characters that uh, can help us in identifying plants and not just sort of uh, identifying them, but also be able to, uh, I mean, these uh, characters would help us in distinguishing one species from the other. And even if it doesn't directly uh, lead us to the identity of the plant, it would at least give us insights in uh, the evolutionary relationships. Okay. And uh, before I joined, I uh, overheard that you guys were uh, sort of asking each other examples of simple and compound plants. And that's exactly what we're going to start with, right? So the most fundamental dichotomy for uh, when it comes to identifying plants is the distinction between a simple and a compound leaf. And although it might seem trivial at the beginning, this distinction is actually far more profound and it can uh, be extremely helpful in uh, helping you identify plants. Uh, now, it's not always easy to distinguish a simple leaf from a compound leaf, right? It seems simple enough an idea, but uh, as you will realize through the course of this presentation that uh, distinguishing a simple leaf from a compound leaf is actually quite tricky. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna learn is to know for sure whether a leaf in your hand is a simple leaf or a compound leaf. And one of the sure shot ways of doing that is to locate what is known as an axillary bud. Okay. And this is what I have shown here in this figure. So before, before I uh, tell you the usefulness of axillary bud, let me just uh, also give you a little background to what uh, kinds of buds uh, a plant has. So any plant has two kinds of bud. It has an apical bud, which is always located at the ends of the branches or at the apices of the branches and it has an axillary bud. Now a tree in theory can continue growing indefinitely through its apical bud. So apical buds have indefinite growth. But what happens if you clip the apical bud? Does the tree stop growing? No. When you cut, cut the apical bud, one of the axillary buds takes over as a function of the apical bud. Okay, so axillary buds uh, generally stay dormant while the apical buds keep growing, but if the apical bud is damaged for some reason, then the axillary bud takes over the function of an apical bud and starts growing in the form of a branch. Now, the reason why axillary bud is so important is because as the name suggests, 
an axillary bud is always always present in the axil of a branch and that of a leaf okay so let me just say that again an axillary bud is always present in the axil of a branch and in the axil of a leaf so basically as you can see here i don't know if you can see my arrow you can see here the angle that is formed by the branch and the axis of the leaf or the leaf stalk that's the angle in which an axillary bud is always located by definition okay and when i say that what i mean is that axillary bud is never ever present in the axil of a leaflet it is always present in the axil of a leaf all right uh, geeta am i still audible yes okay okay wonderful so now once you've located an axillary bud it gives you direct clue as to what constitutes a leaf right so if this is an axillary bud which means that this entire thing that you see here is a leaf and as you can see that the leaf lamina is undivided which makes it a simple leaf on the other hand look at the axillary bud over here so most of the axillary buds that you'll see on plants are always in the form of this small knob like structures okay so uh if this is the axillary bud here then that means that this whole thing that you see over here must be the leaf right and because the leaf lamina is divided into smaller subunits which we call leaflets it is a compound leaf okay so that's the basic distinction between a simple leaf and a compound leaf okay and the axillary bud is the most sure shot way of uh, sort of deciphering the difference between a simple leaf and a compound leaf so let's take a look at the same with the help of an actual plant photograph so let's uh, focus on the picture on the left over here you can see the axillary bud over here which is uh, present in the form of a small knob what you see over here at the end of the branch is what an apical bud looks like okay now an axillary bud tells us where the leaf is so if this is the branch if this is the axillary bud then this whole thing over here must be a leaf right and because it is divided into smaller subunits this has to be a compound leaf now note that an axillary bud is not present in the axil of a leaflet so for those of you who might get confused sometimes into believing that these small subunits that you see here are actually whether they are leaves or leaflets all you have to do is to look for an axillary bud and if you don't see an axillary bud in the axil of a leaflet then it means that it was a leaf in its axil axillary bud uh buds always always present on a plant the answer to that is yes but these axillary buds are not always visible sometimes they are so minute and they are so obscure that it's not easy to always find them but these axillary buds often manifest themselves in the form of flowers or in inflorescences and eventually fruits and often in the form of young branches as well so even if you always don't see an axillary bud or if you are standing quite far and you don't always have the luxury of uh, looking up close at an axillary bud you can always look for other clues such as an inflorescence that you see uh, in the right hand side image uh, on the screen right you can see that that inflorescence or the inflorescence is basically a technical term for a branch which is a specialized branch that produces only flowers so this flowering branch you can see that it's emerging from the axil of a leaf and because that leaf is subdivided into various subunits um you can conclude uh, that it is a, a compound leaf right so you don't always have to look for this tiny axillary bud sometimes just finding inflorescences can also be equally helpful okay now there are also a couple of other things that you can keep in mind to distinguish a simple leaf from a compound leaf and one of those things is to look for what is known as the swollen leaf base now compound leaves typically have um sorry just a second i'm just trying to find my cursor oh there it is right so compound leaves as you can see typically the base of the leaf or the base of the stalk of the leaf you can see that it's slightly swollen than the rest of the of the leaf stalk right and the reason why that is true is because it has it is the point of articulation of the leaf on the branch and it has to sort of take the weight of the entire leaf which is why it's it's sort of slightly uh, more reinforced so that it can bear the weight of the of the whole leaf right and therefore this this swollen leaf base can also be used as a 
as a clue or as a key for identifying what constitutes a leaf. A stalk of a leaflet would not have a swollen leaf base uh, as compared to uh, a stalk, uh, the swollen leaf base of a leaf. Okay, so that's one of one other character that you can use uh, in case you don't you don't find an axillary bud or an inflorescence. Now, the other thing that you can also use is what I call as looking for repeated patterns. Now, if you look at this particular branch here, you would see that uh, there is this beautiful pattern of nine leaflets of which uh, four leaflets are arranged in opposite pairs and the terminal one is unpaired. This pattern of nine leaflets is repeatedly again and again along the entire length of the branch, right? And even if the inflorescences uh, or the axillary buds were not present here, you can use these repeated patterns also as a clue to sort of guessing whether it's a compound leaf or a simple leaf. Now, and another important distinction that you should remember is that a leaf always has a definite growth, right? As opposed to a branch, which has a terminal bud and therefore it has indefinite growth. So if any one of you are confused into thinking that these leaves, what if they are actually branches with leaves arranged on them, then they would not all be of the exact same length with the exact same number of leaves, right? You would see variation in their lengths. You would see the variation in the number of leaves, but that's not what you see. You see the same pattern being repeated over and over again, which sort of tells you that this is actually uh, a compound leaf and not actually um, a, a, a sort of a cluster or aggregate of uh, different leaves. All right. So with that information, what we're going to do is we're going to try and make this, uh, instead of me just talking nonstop throughout, we're going to try and make this a little bit more interactive. Now, just to sort of gauge if I'm able to explain these uh, concepts clearly and also for you to test if you are following on this concepts clearly or not, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a series of uh, pictures now on the screen. And uh, all you have to do is to look at some of these characters that we learned, which is basically look for axillary buds, look for swollen leaf bases, look for repeated patterns. And then you're going to try and find out if the leaf that you see in the picture is a simple leaf or a compound leaf. Okay, so now you're going to start using your uh, chat boxes. And as soon as I show you the picture, you're going to, well, you can take your time. You can take up to five seconds. You're going to start giving your answers on the chat box. Okay. And um, depending, Gita is going to help me with uh, Gita and um, Swati are going to help me with uh, uh, the answers in uh, telling me if how many of you have gotten the answer right and how many of you have gotten the answer wrong. Okay, and don't be afraid uh, to be wrong. It's perfectly fine because if you're wrong, at least you will know where you're going wrong. It will also help me in making this concept slightly more clearer. Okay, so ready? So here goes your first plant. This is a plant that is very familiar to all of you. You may not have seen the actual plant, but uh, you would have uh, surely uh, consumed it uh, in a form of a beverage. So, so this is not exactly a quiz for identifying the plant. This is a coffee plant, but I want you to put in the chat box, whether you think, is it a simple leaf plant or a compound leaf plant? So all you have to do is to just type in a word, either simple or compound. And let me see if I can uh, monitor. Okay. So the answers have started coming already. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. They are all saying that it's a simple leaf. Amazing. Just Absolutely. Just two compounds so far. Oh, there are, uh, there are a few people who think uh, it's a compound leaf. Okay, great. Yeah. So for those of you who thought that it was uh, a compound leaf, so let me just uh, uh, go over some of the concepts again. So of course you can't see an axillary bud because you're looking at this branch from far away, but you do instead see a cluster of flowers and cluster of fruits, right? And remember what I said, these axillary buds often manifest themselves into flowers and fruits. So you, if you see a flower growing from a branch, then that itself is a clue to what a leaf is. And because they're coming from this axil over here, then all of this that coming out from that is a leaf. And because it is undivided, it's a simple leaf, right? So all of you who said that it's a simple leaf are absolutely correct. Okay, so that was a simple one. So let's see if you get this one right. Wow, excellent. That was quick. 
Okay, so all of you are saying it's compound, compound, compound. I hope you're not just not just copying each other's answers. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of you said the pattern gives it away. Excellent. So I'm glad that you're beginning to sort of also look for uh, the repeated patterns. Wonderful. So all of you seem to have got it right. But uh, again, for those of you who might be confused, uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you that there are at least two things that you can see. You cannot ex ex exactly see the axillary bud because it's really, really minute. So really, have, you just have to imagine it. But you can definitely see the swollen leaf bases. That's one, and you also get to see the repeated patterns uh, uh, along along this branch, right? So this is acacia and acacia leaves. You're absolutely right. This is a compound leaf plant. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next one. Uh, and uh, hold on and go. Uh, Navendu, your uh, screen is not okay. Yeah, there it is. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay, excellent, guys. I'm really pleasantly surprised that all of you are getting the answers consistently right. So that's brilliant. So you're right. Uh, this again is quite easy because you can see the flowers coming out. So the axillary bud here is in the form of an inflorescence and you can see that the leaf is actually divided into three distinct uh, subunits or three distinct leaflets, making it a compound leaf. Excellent. So let's do a couple of more. How about this one? Okay. Okay, wonderful. So again, all of you have gotten this right. And this was again, a quite a simple uh, example. So no surprises there. You can see the flowers. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, plant called Caparis and you can see the flowers coming out clearly from the axils over here, uh, making this a leaf and because it's undivided that makes it an entire leaf. Wonderful. Now, Let's try and make things a little more complicated. How about this? Okay. Someone says compound opposite leaves. Well, that's not the right answer. The right answer is simple opposite leaves. And uh, again, you know that because you can clearly see the flowers coming out from the axils uh, over here, right? Which means that each of these long uh, arrow-like things that you see is a single leaf because it's undivided and therefore it's a simple leaves and the leaf arrangement here is opposite, okay? So let's go to the next one. Sorry, I think I skipped one. Yeah, this is the one. Okay, go. Uh, so the, the purpose of this exercise is not to know the name of the plant, okay? We're just getting to know, we're just learning the concept of how to distinguish a simple leaf from a compound leaf. Now the identity of the plant is just the last thing that we achieve as a result of this process. But what is more important at this stage for us is to just learn the difference between a simple leaf and a compound leaf. Okay, and I will eventually tell you the names of the species. This is something that looks like a curry leaf. Some of you would have thought that it's curry leaf, but it's actually not a curry leaf, but it's a close relative of curry leaf. And uh, most of you are uh, right again. It is a plant with uh, compound leaves. You can clearly see these inflorescences coming out from here. And you can also see the swollen leaf bases, which makes the whole of this thing a single leaf. And because it's divided into smaller subunits, it is a compound leaf. Uh, brilliant. Now, let me just, uh, let's uh, have this as a last example, okay? And this is a tricky one. So take your time to uh, sort of observe this carefully and uh, don't be hasty. Uh, make sure that you've observed this plan carefully and then paste in your answers. 
Okay, go. Ha ha. Some of you are, uh, some of you think that it's a compound leaf plant, although most of you still think it's a simple leaf plant. Okay, let me just give you a few more seconds. Some of you have uh, also guessed the identity of the plant correctly, which is great. But uh, quite a good number of you think that it's a compound leaf plant, right? And I don't blame you for thinking that, but the right answer in this case is that this, it's simple leaves. Now, most of you, okay, the answers now. Why many of you got this wrong is because if you look at these branches, they give you an impression of a compound leaf, right? It seems like it's a repeated pattern, repeated all across the length of this branch. Okay, but that's actually uh, quite misleading. Um, now, remember in such scenarios where you're only observing a branch from a long distance and you can't really look at axillary buds, uh, the only uh, clue that you can uh, base your conclusions on is whether a leaf uh, has repeated patterns or not, right? And although in this case, it seems like the leaf seems to have a repeated pattern, but it's actually not true. Because if you look at each of those so-called leaves, for those of you who thought this was a compound leaves, look at the tips of those leaves. You'll see young leaves coming out, right? And you would also see that the length of these so-called leaves are actually not consistent. Some leaves are much longer, like over here, while some leaves are actually shorter. Now that is not possible if it was a leaf. Remember what we learned, every leaf uh, has more or less consistent length and it has consistent number of leaflets, right? But the very fact that at the ends you have younger leaves and the very fact that some of these leaves are actually longer tells you that these are actually not leaves, but these are actually branches. They are, these are miniature branches on which the leaves are arranged uh, in a way that it gives you a superficial appearance of a compound leaf. So if you actually zoom in, and if you look at this plant more closely and carefully, you would also see that in the axils of these tiny, tiny leaves, which appear as leaflets, you'll also see these tiny, tiny flowers coming out from, right? And as some of you rightly guessed, this is actually philanthus, not the amla that we eat, but a relative of philanthus, okay? And if you had seen the flowers, maybe some of you wouldn't have made the mistake, but remember we can't always rely on the availability of flowers. We often have to uh, rely also on other clues uh, into distinguishing a simple leaf from a compound leaf. Okay, so philanthus, you should always be careful of. Philanthus is a scientific name of all the relatives of Amla and it always, always misleads you. So uh, just uh, be careful of, uh, you know, not uh, calling a philanthus leaf a compound leaf and uh, for the reasons that I just uh, told you. Okay, great. So moving on, uh, now we've learned the most sort of basic, sort of the most elementary difference, and that is uh, to uh, how to distinguish a simple leaf from a compound leaf. Now the second dichotomy that we need to familiarize ourselves with is the difference between the different kinds of compound leaves, okay? Now once you've ascertained that a leaf is a compound leaf, the next, next thing that you need to do is to distinguish between what is known as a palmately compound leaf and what is known as a pinnately compound leaf. Now, don't worry too much about the technical terminologies. I'll tell you what exactly each of these terms mean. So now if you focus on the left-hand uh, illustration over here, which uh, clearly says that it's uh, pinnate, you would see that the leaflets are arranged along the axis of, of the leaf, right? Uh, just like the way hairs are arranged along the axis of the central stalk of a feather. So very often pinnately compound leaves are also uh, in simple language referred to as feather-like compound leaves. Okay, and that's because uh, the arrangement of leaflets is just like uh, that of uh, a feather of a bird. But a palmately compound uh, leaf on the other hand has all the leaflets coming out from a single point, just like the digits of your hand or just like your palm, right? And therefore, a digitately compound leaf is also known as a palmately compound leaf, right? So I hope the distinction between two is uh, very clear. It's actually quite simple. I'll just uh, repeat what I said again. If you see all the leaflets 
coming out from a single point, then it's a palmately compound leaf. But if you see that the leaflets are actually sort of staggered along the axis of the leaves, then uh, that's a pinnately compound leaf, okay? And we'll see some examples of this. But before we go into that, let's just also quickly revise what the difference between a compound leaf is and what the difference between a lobed leaf is, okay? Now, if you look at this series of figures over here and second uh, sort of bottom here, which is uh, the leaf of Bohemia or Kanchen, uh, you can see that both these leaves are actually not compound leaves. Okay, these are just lobed leaves. The only leaves that uh, sort of qualify as compound leaves are these four over here. And the reason why I say that is because for it to qualify as a compound leaf, the leaflet, uh, or sorry, the leaf lamina has to be divided all the way to the base of the petiole. Okay, like the case that is seen over here or the illustration seen over here. But if you look at this bohinia, the first two cases, the leaves are just lobe. So they are cut all the way down, but they only cut all the way down to the half and not all the way down to the base of the leaves. So that makes them palmately lobed leaves, but they are still compound leaves. But these four over here are actually palmately compound leaves or digitately compound leaves. Okay, so remember a leaf is compound only if the lamina is divided all the way down to the base. Okay, so this brings us to the third sort of dichotomy or rather a trichotomy of uh, the further classification of feather compound leaves. Okay, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating how feather compound leaves are uh, sort of further divided into these uh, subcategories and uh, you will see why I say it's fascinating. Now, if you look at a feather compound uh, plant, you would find that in most cases, the leaflets are arranged on the primary axis. But there are also cases like that of Gulmohor or the Neel Mohor where you find that the leaflets are actually arranged on the secondary axis, right? So if this is an axillary bud, what emerges from the axillary bud is the primary axis. And then everything that branches off from the primary axis is actually the secondary axis. And if the leaflets are then arranged on the secondary axis, then it is called or classified as a bipinnate leaf. On the other hand, there are also examples such as Murangaka or Moringa or drumstick in which the axis is again divided the third time. So this is an axillary bud. Everything that starts from an axillary bud is the primary axis. There's always one primary axis and you can have multiple secondary axis. And then you can also have third order branching, which is known as tertiary axis. And then the leaflets arranged on that, making it a tripinnate leaf, okay? So the distinction between unipinnate leaf, bipinnate leaf, and tripinnate leaf is actually very simple. All you have to do is to figure out on which order of axis the leaflets are arranged. If they're arranged on the primary axis, then it's unipinnate. If they're arranged on secondary axis, it's bipinnate. And if it's arranged on tertiary axis, then it's tripinnate. So the examples of tripinnate leaves are actually very, very few. Bipinnate leaves are relatively common, but most common examples that you would see are those of unipinnate leaves. Okay, now there are also some uh, very special uh, cases of unipinnate leaves, okay? And these are also uh, very important to sort of recognize. Now, if you look at a pinnate leaf, there's also a difference in the way the leaflets are arranged. In uh, some pinnate leaves, you would find that at the end of the leaf, you would have a sort of unpaired leaflet, which is the terminal leaflet. And therefore, the num total number of leaflets on the leaf are therefore odd number. And this odd pinnate leaf is referred to as an imparipinnate leaf. While if the number of leaflets are even, if they're all in pairs, this is referred to as a paripinnate leaf. Now these often undergo a different sort of extent of reductions. If you look at the species that you see, if you look at butia, for example, you would see a, a butia leaf that looks like this which is sort of a reduced form of an imparipinnate leaf where all the lowermost pairs are lost and you are only left with the topmost three. So a uh, butia leaf is a compound leaf. It's actually a imparipinately compound leaf with only three terminal leaflets. All right. And you can also have a reduced form of paripinnate leaf where only the terminal two leaflets are left behind. Everything else is lost, making it a pinnately bifoliolate leaf. 
sometimes everything else is lost except for just the terminal leaflet and that gives you a false impression that it might be a simple leaf but it's actually a compound unifoliolate leaf okay and we'll see examples of this shortly uh, so just to summarize everything that we've learned so far you have unifoliolate leaves you have bifoliolate leaves you have trifoliolate leaves and then you have unipinnate bipinnate and tripinnate and you also have digitate leaves so digitate leaves generally don't have further classifications but pinnate leaves like i said have unipinnate bipinnate and tripinnate okay now the reason why i'm telling you all this is because just by ascertaining the kind of a compound leaf can directly give you insights on what particular family that plant could belong to okay and i'm going to tell you how you can sort of deduce families based on these uh, leaf characteristics shortly but before we do that let's quickly have another round of quiz now this time your task is slightly more complicated not only do you have to recognize if it's a simple leaf or a compound leaf but you have to go a step further and if it is a compound leaf you also have to tell us whether it's a pinnately compound leaf or a digitately compound leaf okay so that's one if it's a digitately compound leaf that's it you don't have to go further but if it's a pinnately compound leaf you also need to tell us whether it's a unipinnate leaf bipinnate leaf or a tripinnate leaf okay so your answer should be either simple or digitate and if it's pinnately compound then you have to either write whether it's unipinnate bipinnate or tripinnate all right so here goes this is a plant called adenanthera pavoniana uh, i think it's called ratti in uh, south india and these were uh, in the olden times used as uh, sort of currencies for weighing gold the seeds are supposed to be so consistently uh, are supposed to be of such consistent weight that uh, they almost uh, were used as units for uh, measuring gold okay so um, let me see if the answers have started coming in and uh, some of you have already started giving answers some of you said it's unipinnate some of you said it's bipinnate um bipinnate compound impinnate um so you getting all kinds of responses now but at least some of you are not saying that it's a simple leaf so at least i'm glad about that um great so let's take a look at why it's a compound leaf and let's also then try and find out what kind of compound leaf it is okay so like i said you don't get to see axillary buds but although you can see axillary buds if you have great i said you would have but here but you do actually see inflorescences which you can use to uh, sort of find out what a leaf is and you can see that this inflorescence is actually coming out from this point right which makes the whole of this thing a single leaf and if you look at the axis on which the leaflets are arranged if this is the leaf this is the primary axis everything that branches from that is the secondary axis and the leaflets are arranged on that and therefore it's a bipinnate leaf okay so all of you who said that it's a bipinnately compound leaf are right those of you who thought it was a unipinnate leaf well it's a confusing picture so i don't blame you but uh, this is how we're going to uh see plants you know in in the wild you're not always going to be able to touch them because they might be high up they might be inaccessible so you often have to observe them through binoculars and then make your deductions based on what you see okay so let's go to the next one uh your time starts now go for it wait sorry yeah some of you are saying compound or simple <laughs> yes obviously it'll either be a compound leaf or a simple leaf um unipinnate simple compound okay so uh, this is again a tricky example and uh, all of you who have uh, given the answer as simple are absolutely correct but all of you who thought that it's a compound leaf again sort of got uh, misled by the notorious philanthus right the emblica the relatives of emblica this is an another relative of emblica uh, called philanthus and uh, 
again have thought a unique unit leaf, but you can clearly see the fruits here that are hidden uh, under the leaves, right? And those fruits are actually coming out from the axils of these tiny things. If this whole thing was a leaflet, you wouldn't see fruits coming out from the axils of the leaflets. You would see the fruits somewhere over here, right? So this is again an example of a, a simple leaf and this is philanthus, okay? All right, so let's do uh, one more. This is again a very tricky one, a difficult one. So take your time and, uh, try and uh, guess whether it's a simple leaf or a compound leaf. And if you think it's a compound leaf, then what kind of compound leaf it is? Someone says simple unipine. Okay, someone's still uh, in for the previous question. Wait, hold on. Let me just uh, start. Uh, okay, you guys can start now. Unipinate, bipinate, simple compound, simple bipinate. So I'm getting all kinds of answers, which means that uh, we need to sort of revisit some of these questions. So remember I said that the difference between a simple leaf and a compound leaf might seem very simple, but it's actually quite difficult and you really have to apply yourself and uh, sort of focus on these uh, clues and characters that uh, help you in distinguishing uh, a simple leaf from a compound leaf. So what can we use in this case? Okay, so I want all of you to focus in these sort of very sort of globose and bulbous axillary buds, which can be seen very, very clearly, right? If that's an axillary bud, then everything that starts from that is actually a leaf, correct? Now, if you look at on which of the axes the leaflets are arranged, they're actually not arranged on the primary axis, they're actually arranged on the secondary axis. This short stalk over here, that is actually the primary axis, which then splits into two secondary axes. And on that, the leaflets are then arranged, right? So this is an example of a bipinnate leaf. And this is actually a plant called Caliandra, which is very commonly planted in gardens, which is also known as powder puff uh, plant because of uh, its uh, showy flowers, okay? so. Okay, so let's try and look at some more examples. How about this one? Go for it. Okay, huh. so again, I'm getting all kinds of answers. So for those of you who've uh, answered unipinate, you're right. Those of you who answered bifoliate, you're also right. Some of you who have answered palmate, you are also right. But some of you who thought that it was a bipinate leaf, uh, only those people are, so, so, so like, yeah, some of you said compound bipinnate, so that's not a right answer. But those of you who thought it was a unipinnate leaf or a bifoliate leaf or a digitate leaf, all of you are absolutely right. Now, how can a plant be simultaneously unipinnate and also digitate, right? So you can have these special cases where, okay, so let's start from the beginning. So we don't have axillary buds, but we do have inflorescences. You can see this inflorescence emerging from this point, which makes this whole thing a leaf. Right? And because this whole leaf is divided into two distinct subunits, the two leaflets, it makes it a unipinnate leaf with only two leaflets. But because both these leaflets are coming out from a single point, uh, it also sort of satisfies the definition of a digitate leaf. Okay, But for it to be a digitate leaf, generally you need to have more than two leaflets. Okay, so this is actually a unipinnate leaf with just two leaflets. And this is a plant called Hardwickia bainata. Uh, it's a tree that is uh, found in the Deccan Plateau and Central India. It's a, it's a very unique tree because it's a monotypic genus, which means 
in this genus there is only a single species and this species is endemic to uh, the indian subcontinent uh, okay so let's move on to the next one now this is one of the toughest plants uh, that you would come across if you are to ascertain whether it's a simple leaf or a compound leaf okay so i'll give you uh, a little bit of time all of you have 10 seconds before you start answering so don't uh, don't hurry don't rush uh, into giving your answer take your time um uh, and then uh, sort of hold on yeah now you can start giving your answers unipinnate uh, someone says bipinnate someone says uh, bipinnate bifoliate someone says bipinnate someone says unipinnate compound by compound by foliolate okay not bad so still quite a lot of you a significant number of you seem to have gotten it right so the correct answer here is that it's a bipinnate leaf and the interesting thing is that it's an extremely reduced form of a bipinnate leaf okay so the repeated pattern that you should have recognized here is this cluster of four leaflets and that is repeated here it's repeated here of course here one of the leaflets is lost it's repeated here and it's also repeated here you can also see something like an axillary bud over here okay so if this is an axillary bud what emerges from an axillary bud is a primary axis which then splits into two secondary axis and on those two secondary axis you get to see the leaflets but the number of leaflets again on every secondary axis is just two okay but that's still a bifoliolate leaf but it's the most reduced sort of form of a bifoliolate leaf okay so let's take a look at this example now let's see how many of you get this right okay so the answers have started coming um some of you have said simple some of you have said unipinnate some of you said bipinnate some of you say uh palmate okay have i gotten any right answers so far okay gaurav says it's tripinnate great uh satish fatki also says it's tripinnate wonderful so all of you who thought that this was a tripinnate leaf you are absolutely spot on those of you who thought that it was a bipinnate leaf you are also correct those of you who thought that it was a unipinnate leaf you are also correct so the only people who are wrong are the people who thought that this is a simple leaf or the people who thought that it was a digitate leaf now again how can a, a leaf be simultaneously unipinnate bipinnate and tripinnate now the answer to that is because a tripinnate leaf is never actually tripinnate throughout the length of its leaf okay so you see axillary buds over here very clearly uh hold on yeah so you can see an axillary bud over over here very clearly you can also see the swollen leaf base which means the whole of this thing that you see in the picture is a single leaf right now what emerges from the axillary bud is the primary axis and then you see that the primary axis here splits into this secondary axis and then the secondary axis again over here splits into tertiary axis on which the leaflets are arranged right but if you go towards the apex of the leaf you would see that the leaflet is arranged directly on the primary axis if you are somewhere in the middle you would see that the leaflets are arranged on the secondary axis making it a bipinnate leaf while at the base uh you see that the leaflets are arranged on the tertiary axis making it a tripinnate leaf right so for all purposes this leaf is still classified as a tripinnate leaf but a tripinnate leaf often towards the end shows other conditions such as bipinnate and unipinnate but like i said if you see a tripinnate condition you qualify that species as a tripinnate leaf all right okay so in the interest of time i think we'll just uh, stop that quiz over here but let me just show you some more examples so this i remember i was telling you a trifoliolate leaf is a reduced form of a imparipinnate leaf where all the subsequent lower pairs are lost except the other three this is 
a typical bipinnate leaf uh, uh, look what a bipinnate leaf looks like uh, you have uh, primary axes and then you have secondary axes and then you have multiple leaflets on the secondary axis so all the relatives of babool or touch me not family they all show these kind of leaves okay uh, let's actually do one more example because this is a tricky one and some of you might be familiar with the species but let's uh, let's see if you let's see how many of you get this one right hold on don't give your answers yet let me just uh, mark the beginning of uh, this particular question hold on i don't want names of species i just need whether it's a simple leaf or a compound leaf and then what kind of compound leaves are okay good so go uh some of you say it's a simple leaf some of you say palmate some of you say palmately compound most of you are saying it's a palmately compound some of you are saying that it's a world leaf uh some of you say it's a simple leaf so large majority continue to say that it's a compound leaf okay so i deliberately put this plant over here just to sort of mislead you and some of you did get uh, misled so it appears that it is a digitately compound leaf but actually it's not okay it's a plant with simple leaves which has world phyllotaxy which means there are multiple leaves coming out of a single node and how do we know that now there is no way we would have known if it's a simple leaf or a digitately compound leaf but if you look very closely look where this branch is coming from okay it's coming from axils of one of these leaves over here right and if that is an axil then that entire thing is undivided making that a simple leaf and you have multiple leaves like that arranged in a whorl on a branch right if that was a uh, actually a digitate leaf you wouldn't have another leaf coming out from the axils of one of the leaflets of the digitate leaves right so this is alstonia tree or the scholar's tree or the devil's tree and uh, this typically shows this kind of world phyllotaxy which can uh, sort of fool you into believing that it's actually a digitate leaf okay so uh, let's uh, skip actually let's do this uh, last one the last plant of the quiz let's see how many of you get uh, this right uh, hold on just don't start uh, giving your answers uh, yet uh, i want you guys to spend enough time looking at this particular plant because this is the trickiest of them all and if you get this right then i think uh, you would have gotten the concept of simple and compound uh, right okay so hold on don't give in your answers yet and yes now you can start giving your answers ruchita says it's simple ramit says it's simple uh shield says it's compound most of you say it's simple wow i'm surprised um radha says it's compound okay interesting hmm okay wonderful uh so let's uh, stop there you guys can stop posting your answers so the right answer in this case is that it is not a simple leaf like most of you thought it is a, actually a compound leaf with just a single leaflet okay so it's a pinnate leaf it's a pinnately unifoliate leaf okay now observe carefully okay observe very carefully where all these inflorescences are coming out from you can see that this is an inflorescence you can see that this is an inflorescence which is coming out from here right which means that this whole thing that you see here is a leaf you can also see a swollen leaf base here now most of you thought that it was a simple leaf because the lamina is completely undivided and you weren't wrong in thinking so but the problem is that this is not where this leaf originates this so called leaf actually originates sorry this so called leaf actually originates over here can you see that there is another point of articulation over here and it has also swollen leaf base you can see the clear difference in the coloration uh in the swelling and also the color from the rest of the petiole so this is actually the most reduced form of an imparipinnate leaf where all the lowermost pair of leaflets are lost except for the terminal most unpaired leaflet 
right? So this is an example of Desmodium and many species of Desmodium show this reduced form of unipinnate leaves. Okay, so for those of you who thought that this was a compound leaf uh, are absolutely right and you should give yourself a pat on the back for getting this rice because this was, uh, I think, by far the trickiest uh, of, of them all. Okay, now, of course, uh, by the end of this uh, session, there's no way you would be able to start identifying plants on your own, right? Now, this is, like I said at the beginning, is a long, uh, uh, extremely long process, but based on what uh, we've learned so far, let's at least try and learn a few things so that uh, we can um, sort of learn how these characters can lead you into uh, sort of diagnosing certain families. Okay, so here's an example of one of the most commonly observed families around us, which is the legume family. Okay, now legume family consists of all those plants which have these typical fruits that are known as pods. So what are pods? Pods are basically these fruits in which the seeds are arranged in a single row. So take for example a groundnut or take for example a pea pod. All of these you would see that the seeds are arranged in a single row and they are covered by a jacket which sort of splits open but it not, doesn't necessarily have to split open. But all of these plants, all of the pulses that we eat, pigeon's pea, chickpea, uh, cassia, fistula, gulmohor, all of these show this peculiar kind of fruit which is known as pod, which sort of makes them uh, closely related to each other and they all belong to this large super family called the legume family. Now interestingly, the legume family will always, always show compound leaves. You will not find a single member of a legume family that shows simple leaves, right? So every time you come across a compound leaf, the first thought that should come to your mind is, does it belong to the legume family? Um, and then what you do is to then try and find out whether that compound leaf is a unipinnate leaf, whether it's a bipinnate leaf or whether it's a tripinnate leaf and how can that be useful? Now, this is how it's useful. The legume family is sort of, sort of further divided into three subfamilies. The first one is the pea family, which is known as Fabaceae. So erythrinas, buteas, all the pulses that we eat belongs to the pea family. The second family is the Cisalpinaceae family, to which Cassia fistula or Gulmohor belongs to. And the third one is the Mimosaceae family, not plant belongs to. Now, all these three sort of fall on the complexity of pinnate leaves. The Fabaceae family or the pea family will always, always only exhibit unipinnate leaves. Okay. And this is something that you should note down. Fabaceae family always, always shows unipinnate leaves. The, if you go to the other extreme, the Mimosaceae family or the Touch Me Not family will always show bipinnate leaves. But the Gulmohor family is the confusing one. Right? It is that family which shows characters that are intermediate to both Fabaceae and Mimosaceae because it shows both conditions, which is sort of unipinnate and bipinnate. But then there again, there are ways of distinguishing uh, the Gulmohor family from the pea family. Now, if you look at a unipinnate leaf, so if you, if you find a leaf which has unipinnate leaves, it could either belong to Fabaceae or Cisalpinaceae. But in Cisalpinaceae family, you would never find a terminal unpaired leaflet. So if you find a terminal unpaired leaflet, which is basically an imparipinate leaf, then it belongs to the family Fabaceae or the pea family. But if all the leaflets are in pairs, then it belongs to the Cisalpinaceae family. Right. Now, what if you have a bipinnate leaf? If you have a bipinnate leaf, it could belong to touch me not family or it could belong to Cisalpinaceae family. Now, the trick here is to look for what are known as glands, which are these tiny globular projections which are sort of scattered on the rachis of the leaf. Okay, so if this is the rachis, you would see that the leaves have glandular structures in the family mimosaceae, which are not at all present in the Gulmohor family. Okay, so that those glands can then be used to sort of uh, diagnose mimosaceae family different from a Cisalpinaceae family. Okay, so this was just a, a small window into how you can use these very, very uh, sort of basic and simple clues and characters for diagnosing one family from the other, right? And if you consistently keep doing this, if you, every time you go out, if you observe a plant, if you try and find out whether it's a simple leaf or a compound leaf, 
uh, and you can always start with the plants that you're already familiar with, right? If I ask you the mango tree that all of you are so familiar with, if I ask you whether it has uh, uh, oppositely arranged leaves or alternately arranged leaves, not all of you would be able to tell me confidently, right? Because we've just not gone close enough and observed those characters. But it's important that we start associating these characters with certain families or at least those members that you are familiar with, right? And then, like I said, the final goal is to sort of build this database in your brain where you start associating some of these characters with some of these families. And the reason why we do that is because these characters are generally consistent at the level of each family. Uh, so much so that when you see a combination of these characters, you can almost safely diagnose uh, a particular family, if not the species. Okay, and once you ascertain whether you're looking at a leaf or a leaflet, then it's absolutely easy to then find out whether the leaves are arranged opposite to each other or alternate to each other or if they are in whorls. And uh, you get very beautiful patterns in the way the leaves are arranged. Like in this case, this is a plant called Hypericum. You see that every uh, subsequent pair is arranged at right angles to each other. So not only are the leaves simple and arranged opposite to each other, but they are arranged precisely at 90 degrees to each other, giving this beautiful pattern of leaves, right? Uh, we already saw the example of Alstonia where leaves are arranged in a single whorl. Right? They're all coming out from a single point. And this sort of leaf arrangement is seen in the milkweed family to which uh, Alstonia belongs to. There are also some plants which uh, gives you a false impression of uh, leaves being actually present in whorls or leaves being digitately compound, but they're actually neither. This is an example of a simple leaf, but it's not a whorl leaf. If you actually zoom into uh, uh, closely into the branch. As you can see in the picture over here, you can see that the leaves are actually not coming from the same point, but they're actually coming one below the uh, one below other. Uh, but it's just that they're so tightly sort of crowded and clustered towards the end of the branches that it gives you an appearance of a whorl leaf or a digitately compound leaf. Now, apart from looking at leaf characters, you can also look at uh, the architecture of the plant. Now, in this case, this is an example of Terminalia and you would see how beautifully the leaves are arranged, right? The leaves are arranged in clusters and they are crowded at the end of the branches. So the branch terminates into sort of a cluster of leaves and then there's another branch coming from below the cluster, which then again goes and terminates into another cluster of leaves. And then it goes on continues uh, like that in the form of a wave-like fashion. So if I, if one has to sort of uh, schematically represent this uh, arrangement, then it would look something like this, where every branch sort of terminates into a cluster of leaves and another one emerges from below that and it goes on like that. So this sort of architecture is known as the Obrovils model. And many plant families such as the Terminalia, such as the Sapota family, the Avocado family, um, Mango family, uh, all of these families are known to show this kind of branching pattern. And uh, if you come across a species that shows this branching pattern, then you certainly narrowed down on these sort of few families that shows this uh, pattern. Then there are certain families in which all the branches almost always come out from a single point, right? So not the leaves are whirled, but the branches in this case are whirled. All of you are familiar with the silk cotton tree or the bombax tree. That's the best example of a whirled branching pattern. This is an example of uh, nutmeg. This is, this is a wild nutmeg called Nima. And you can see how beautifully all the branches are coming out from a single point, giving it a, a wagon wheel like branching pattern. So a, a tree architecture can also be very, very useful in telling you what uh, family uh, that species could belong to. And then we can get into shapes. And again, we don't have to get into this uh, technicalities of what each of these shapes mean. Each of these uh, technical shapes can be very easily described in the form of whether a leaf is egg-shaped or whether a leaf is inversely or rather inverted egg-shaped, whether it is like a rugby ball, whether it's like a spear shape. And some of these leaf shapes are also consistent at, at the level of, of the species. So these can be extremely useful for distinguishing one species from the other. Uh, but you should be careful that uh, not all species have consistent, they also have extremely variable leaf shape. So it's important to associate a certain species, you would have made sure that that character is consistently observed at the level of that species, right? And um, I'm afraid in the interest of uh, time, we're gonna have to stop here, but 
you can go on and the point that i'm trying to make here is that plant plants offer you a huge number of clues and characters for identifying them right so the last thing that uh, you would want to hear is that all plants look the same okay so that is absolutely not an acceptable excuse because all you have to do is to go closer to the plant and observe these characters and it's like the plants are giving you a huge number of clues and characters uh, to their identity uh, and similarly i can go on you can also look at secondary nerves uh, some plants do not have prominent secondary nerves some plants like the callophyllum have beautiful parallel uh, minute translucent secondary nerves some plants have very interestingly arranged tertiary nerves to, such as uh, horizontally arranged tertiary nerves like in this case of genus lasianthus all the species of this genus show this kind of venation many of the plants have these cavities in the axils of their secondary nerves which are known as domitia uh, which are sort of houses for uh, uh, insects or organisms which are of uh, beneficial nature to a particular plant right so these insects are provided shelter by the plant and the insect in turn uh, sort of uh, provide services to the plant by protecting it from herbivores right so many leaves have these domitia uh, like cavities in the axils of their secondary nerves and therefore these can also be used as an identifying leaf indumentum that is how the texture of the leaf is can also be very very useful some of them have tomentos like a uh, velvety texture some of them are just hairy some of them are smooth on some plants uh, are scattered with uh, this powdery uh, sort of uh, a, a, a texture which is called as uh, tomentum in this case it's a granular tomentum and some members such as uh, the members of support or chiku family have these kind of leaves uh, yeah and there are also stipules uh, which can be used uh, for identifying plants so uh, plants such as figs and jackfruits have these stipules which although they fall off the leaf leave a very distinct sort of a concentric ring uh, on the stem from where they've fallen off and these concentric rings are reminiscent of the fact that there was a stipule over there at some point of time and there are not many families which have stipules so the presence of stipules or stipulous scars can then be used for identifying uh, families such as dipterocarpaceae moraceae and so on and so forth of course exudates are also one way of uh, narrowing down on your options but uh, you would have to sort of pluck a leaf or make an incision or sort of uh, scar the trunk which is not always advisable but nevertheless if you come across latex that can also gives you clues to uh, what family a particular plant could belong to so this is just to summarize everything that we've learned so far so we started off with the process of deduction by elimination by learning two simple things for simple leaf for a compound leaf and if it's a compound leaf what kind of compound leaf it is and then based on that we try and ascertain the phylotaxy we try and find out what the arrangement of leaflets are what the arrangement of leaves are and that itself is sufficient for sort of eliminating most of our options and then with whatever few options you left with you can then use these additional characters such as presence or absence of stipules clustering of leaves uh Uh, leaf margins nerve arrangement glands aroma and then there are just huge number of characters which you can then potentially use for distinguishing plants right so i think uh, we'll stop here today and uh, i'm not sure if we'll be able to take questions but uh, i'll be happy to take feedback uh, uh, as is the first time actually i'm doing it uh, remotely uh, through an online sort of a media i normally do this as a workshop in person and therefore it's lot more easier to then uh, make these concepts clearer and then sort of individually uh, sort of make sure that everybody uh, has understood the concepts but uh, i think given the limitations of this platform i think all of you guys did great most of you got most of the answers right so uh, well done all of you and um, i think uh, that is all i uh, had today so i would uh, recommend all of you i would suggest all of you encourage all of you to continue uh, with what you uh, learned today go out there keep observing plants keep finding out if they have if they have simple leaves or compound leaves look at their arrangement look at what is peculiar about them and uh, sort of keep sort of Uh, accumulating this knowledge base in your in your in your head 
and eventually in the long run i think you would be able to do a great job of uh, identifying plants so that's thanks it. so much thanks so much navendu we are one and a half hours on and there are still 200 people who are participating in this workshop so amazing thanks for that wonderful wonderful talk uh, many people are asking if there will be a part 2 and 3 so we could we could definitely consider doing a continuation of this part given uh, that you guys have responded so well and i'm very happy about that so i guess we could do a continuation of this where uh, those of you who attended the first part can also attend the second part and we can sort of take this forward and see how we can build on this knowledge and uh, sort of uh, get better at identifying plants that's really nice that's awesome uh, for those of you who are interested in attending let's say i mean we'll work it out i guess if there's a part 2 or 3 uh, do keep a look out on the season watch uh, social media pages and we'll be announcing uh, any other sessions that we might do with navendu uh, there will be a recording of this session available on youtube uh, later on uh maybe next week so yeah if you miss something live on this talk you can always catch up on the youtube uh archive of season watch uh someone's asking to share links please do you have any resources navendu that you can suggest that people can look up uh, easily so, to you know quickly look at some plants so And what if, i can definitely do is uh, i don't know how i can uh, i can share this presentation but what i missed telling you in my talk was there are a few guides which are absolutely sort of essential to have in your collection and one of those guides is pradeep krishan's book on jungle trees of central india now it is by far the best field guide i have ever seen not just uh, not just for india but at global level i have not seen a better field guide than that and the great advantage of that book is that it is it also based on the same kind of characters that we learn today right the way the plants are arranged in that book is entirely based on whether they are simple or compound and with their leaf arrangement so anybody without having any prior background in botany i think uh, should be able to identify a plant using that field guide uh, so i would definitely encourage you to uh, get hold of that book trees of delhi is also similar but uh, the jungle trees of central india is 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 most and although it is focused on trees of central india it is something that can also be applied to other parts of the country as well right so that is a uh, one resource that i would definitely recommend and i would be also happy to share this presentation uh, with you guys so that uh, you can keep uh, referring to some of these concepts at a later stage uh, so wherever this uh, lecture is archived below that in the description we'll give you links to the pdf version of this uh, presentation and also all the other resources that uh, navindu has mentioned that you can look up for reference okay i think uh, that's about all for now uh, thank you so much navendu for this riveting session on uh, discovering what a plant is and the identity of a plant and thank you all for joining us over here uh, we welcome any questions uh, please uh, you can send your queries to this email id sw@seasonwatch dot in and i'm just typing that over here for you all to write to so you can always send a query um here ab uh, about plants about uh, whatever you've learned in this session and we can forward it to navendu yeah thanks a lot everyone thanks for joining us you. and bye. see you soon thanks thanks, thanks. bye yeah bye